In the one surviving photograph of Scott and his work gang, Scott is the only man smiling. And yet, if Scott's to be believed, the picture of hardship in these faces tells only half the story. Because behind that hardship, Scott found a purpose in Magneto Ghost that left him amazed. I couldn't say how many suffered that hardship willingly. Some had come because they had no choice, they, they needed work, but others came, I mean this, with a burning enthusiasm, wanting to take part. My roommate was a young Russian called Kolya. We had the best room in the barrack because he was the, uh, the foreman on my shift. His enthusiasm, right from the first day I arrived, it was infectious. I mean, where you come from, they build big. Yes? Yes. American iron and steel, biggest in the world, yes? Yes. Yes, well here we'll build bigger. Except the difference is, in America, who takes the profit? The bosses. Capitalist parasites, hmm? What I build, I build for myself. Every rivet in this plant, we all have a share. If some damn fool rigger freezes to death for some capitalist's profit, that makes me angry. If some damn fool rigger freezes to death for me and for you, for every Soviet man and woman and child, then that, my American friend, makes me very proud. On the shift, you'd see people staring up at what we'd built. There was one man, his name was Kaibulin. He was a shepherd from Kazakhstan. One year earlier, he'd never seen a staircase. He'd never seen a train. He'd never seen a light bulb. And now here he was building the biggest blast furnace in the world. And it was his. As much as anyone's, it was his. The atmosphere was extraordinary. There was a room in every barrack called the Red Corner. Newspapers on the wall, banners, pictures of Lenin and Stalin, a library. Ours had over 200 books. Six o'clock every night, the whole barrack, men and women, met there with guitars and balalaikas. And they'd sing workers' revolutionary songs, uh, folk tunes, love songs. And then we'd talk. First maybe grumbles, why is the bread ration cut? Uh, why is there so little sugar? But then someone would explain the party line, how one day the Soviet Union wouldn't have to export its sugar anymore, how one day there'll be enough for all. And people would listen and accept, because for all the hardship, there was a wonderful optimism that tomorrow would be better. And that somehow made it all worthwhile.